Baby, baby. 
Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Ken Mark from the Donna Congregation. It's good to have you this morning fellowshipping and worshiping with us on a Sunday morning like this. Uh, this morning, uh, while we are here worshiping, we also have the general church worshiping on Zoom this morning. So it's a lovely day. And uh, before we go into the worship of today, let me just read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Hebrews 4 verse 16 and let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need let us come boldly into the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy for the time of need so this morning lord i want to pray that as we zoom in as we uh, 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 as we worship from all over the world and people you know tuning in both here in the uk and outside the, you know the, the country we ask oh god that your grace and your presence oh god will be made manifest in the service of this morning as we go into the worship we ask oh god that your presence will take over and your glory shall be seen in everything we do today in the name of jesus uh kwamina will be preaching the word of god for us this morning. So let's just worship and give him glory. And in a short while, Kwamina will be available to bring the word to us. God bless you. For me within 
chosen, Lord, to live your house. We are chosen and invited to run in. We are yours. We are yours. We are yours. We are yours. We are free to live as sons and daughters in your house. We are chosen and invited to run in. We are free to live as sons and daughters in your house. We are chosen and invited to run.
breaking my heart of stone, taking over like a hysterical. My walls are all crashing down right now. I know you're able. My God will come through again. You can do all things. You can do all things but fail because you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. I know, I know, you never will. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never will. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never lost a battle. You never will. the battle Hey, good morning. Can you believe today is the one year anniversary of Hope Church being online? What that means is this is our 53rd online service. And it's been a year that none of us would have imagined a, a year ago at the beginning of March. And I want to today talk to you a little bit about, as as a country moving out of lockdown, how we as a church are gonna be moving back to physical meetings. It's so encouraging to see across our country that the immunisation rates are increasing, that infection rates are dropping, less people in hospital. It still means there are families at risk, families that need prayer, that, that are catching COVID still. We need to be vigilant, but we can be full of hope. We can be full of expectation and start planning to return back physically. As a church, we have decided that we're going to mirror the stages that the civic society is following as we come out of lockdown. What that means is as we move out of stage one and to stage two, we're gonna take the opportunities that gives us to meet together. At the end of this month of March, we're encouraged to um, be allowed to meet in groups of up to six outdoors. And as a church, we're gonna look at how we can take advantage of that, how we can start meeting, uh, weather permitting outside for friendship, for discipleship, for even sharing our faith. But I guess the stage beyond that, which we're all asking is, when will we start meeting physically? Well, we're believing, like the government, that at the beginning of April, on the 12th of April, uh, the nation will move to stage two. And as we move to stage two, and if we see infec infection rates continuing to level off and not rapidly increase, we will start meeting again physically. And what that means is, on Sunday the 18th of April, our churches will start opening up. Now, each of our congregations meet in a different setting and in different contexts. Some buildings we manage or own, others we use a school facility or somewhere else. So it doesn't mean that all our congregations will open on the same day, but we will start opening as we're allowed, physically meeting, booking in and coming to worship together. We'll also be looking to open our, on, 
our weekday programs and our evening programs. A lot of that is subject to guidance that has not yet been published and it may coincide with the next stage, which is stage three, which will be mid to late May. But if that's earlier, we'll take advantage of that. We're keen to regather our seniors groups and some of our youth and children's ministry. So as guidance allows that, we will move that way forward. Going forward beyond then, I wanna say that we will still be giving an online offer. I know that for some of us, meeting physically is not possible. Some of you watching us are geographically not even in Bromley Borough, but you still want to worship with us. So we will still be doing an online service. The format of that may change in the coming weeks and we might rework that a little bit, but there will be a Sunday weekly offer for you. Some of our physical venues will be able to offer a live stream. And where that's possible, we'll be looking to add that. But that won't be possible everywhere we meet. We know that we need good Wi-Fi um, connectivity and internet, and we need the facilities and the resources to make live streaming happen. So you may find that your particular congregation won't have a live stream option, but another one will. We will make sure there'll be at least one live stream option each weekend. The other thing that we have discovered though in this season is the joy of what we call our live and local, which is meeting on Zoom and holding a service and a meeting and a gathering where we can interact more together while physically being apart. We've been very stirred to look at disciple making in this season. And can you join us as we pray and look at how we can keep that aspect of our gathering together? So whether you can physically join us on a Sunday or you are actually not able even to be available on Sunday, you can find an online option to watch in the week. Or whether you want something more interactive, as a church, we want to be meeting each of those needs. Please pray, please be expectant. All of this is dependent on we continuing to see COVID reduce and it be wise and safe to meet. But we wanted to update you, wanted to tell you about that. Just now we're going to look at a video from Steve Oliver as we have an opportunity next weekend on Saturday to gather not just in Bromley but across this nation and across this globe with our family of regions beyond and to celebrate and thank God for all he's done in this last year amongst us. Greetings dear friends across the regions beyond family. It's so exciting to know that on the 27th of March, we will be having our very first online gathering for our worldwide regions beyond family. Whether you are in the north, the south, the east or the west, there is an opportunity for us to truly gather as one for the purposes of God. Great news about places you might not even know we're working into, lovely updates, time of worship, which is, comes from all over the world, input and the word of God all in one hour. We are trusting God that we would have the most amazing time and thereafter gather together in a Zoom community room. Please join us on Saturday the 27th of March in your time zone. The times will come up at the end of the short clip. God bless you. See you Saturday the 27th of March. Over the past few weeks, I've been catching up over Zoom with our staff who do a lot of work behind the scenes. So this is an opportunity to find out a bit about who they are and what they do. Over the past couple of days, I've had the privilege of catching up with our congregational leaders um, just to find out a bit about their roles and um, what an average day looks like for them. Hi Bruce. Hi Molly. Could you just tell us a little bit about what you do here at Hope Church, uh, what your role involves and what you get up to behind the scenes? 
Yeah, sure. So I lead the Bromley North congregation. We're a fairly new congregation, just started last year, end of last year. So it kind of involves pulling together the team, making sure that as at the moment we're pretty much a core team, the whole church. There's probably about 30, 40 of us that meet. So yeah, it's, it's pulling everyone together, making sure that we, we are heading in a good direction. We're just starting to do an alpha course. So I've been pulling that together with Tim and others. It involves, you know, pastoral work um it's been difficult during covid obviously to get out and about yeah. but um but have zoom meetings with people you know messaging making sure that people are okay it's uh it's good to see god moving in people's lives and that's the essential thing that's what we're here for so yeah amazing could you just tell us how long you've been um, at hope for and how you started i think risha and i have been around hope for about three and a half years in terms of how we how we sort of like got into this role i guess um one day I'd gone up to the regions beyond hub that we had before COVID in, um, in London, Westminster Chapel. And Tony grabbed me after, after one of them and had a conversation. He said, I just wanted to talk something through these. He said, an opportunity has come up for work at, uh, at Hope. And at the time I was just about to start a Bible college um, degree. So um, okay. I needed part-time work. And, and he said to me, you can, you can be cleaning at the church if that's what you want to do. But I, I saw it as a great opportunity to really get involved. And, uh, you know, David said in the Bible, I, he'd rather be um, in, the, in, the, in the house of the Lord than anywhere else. And I thought, well, I'll be in the house of the Lord. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and the amazing thing is I discovered that Daniel McLeod, for those of us that remember Daniel, great guy, great leader. Uh, he, um, he also started the same way and that became a, a big joke um, amongst us as yeah. a yeah, in the team because uh, obviously you know become a cleaner in the church and you become a pastor one day so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. is there anything that you didn't expect um when joining hope church and becoming um yeah the leader from the from the north well i i think i'd say probably the biggest thing is is the the style of of um the team that we have the staff team and you know the leadership team and so on because I've been around a few churches and, and I've never really come across a church like this that has such an integrated and, and well working team of, of leaders, particularly as we've got various, you know, six congregations now. And it just works like a dream. Well, thank you so much, Bruce. That's all right. It's been a real pleasure to come on. Thank you, Molly. Hi, Colin. Hi, Molly. Could you just tell us a little bit about what you do here at Hope? Um, what your role is, what it involves, what you get up to behind the scenes. Yeah, I'm one of the elders of the church. So obviously that involves looking after the church in a corporate sense, but then also I'm the congregational leader at our West Wickham congregation, which obviously involves um, looking after people, making sure they're all all right, especially during this COVID time, preparing programs, preparing sermons and messages uh, and all that sort of, uh, stuff doing the a bit of administration um, obviously i've got a team of people that work with me over there and uh, i spend time meeting with them and looking after them and obviously i have to run the zoom meetings as well midweek and uh, on sundays so it's quite a varied post if you want to call it that could you tell us a bit about how you um started here at hope and how long you've been here now yeah um well i moved here something like six years ago, just over six years ago, having retired from uh, being in full-time ministry for over 50 years. Um, and then we just joined the Orpington congregation and uh, we've been part of that ever since. Amazing. Is there anything that you didn't expect when you started leading West Wickham? Well, I think the thing I didn't expect was to lead the West Wickham. I was asked yeah, to go sure. over there to support it. I never yeah. expected to lead it. So that was yeah. my biggest... <laughs> I yeah. thought, well, that's finished. <laughs> yeah. What's your favourite thing about working for Hope? I think my favourite thing about working for Hope is the people. It's just such a great place to be, and the people are great. And I think, for me, the leadership team is amazing. We've got such a relationship, friendship, and unity uh, that is, mm -hmm. you know, to die for, as they say. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Hi, Gary. Hi, Molly. Dad. <laughs> Can you just tell us a little bit about what you do here at Hope Church? Yeah, 
I guess it's quite a varied role, but my primary role, uh, which I uh, tend to focus on around uh, two, two and a half days a week, is leading the Orpington congregation, which I've been doing for uh, almost two years. Um, and that's, I guess, my primary role, which I thoroughly enjoy. And uh, I'm also a trustee or director of the trust. So that involves a certain amount of um, time as well to make sure that we are legal. And I've also been quite uh, heavily involved at times uh, with the food hub uh, and increasingly now uh, looking at uh, a new venue and leading a team uh, to look at in terms of potentially selling our main uh, building, the Goodmead Centre, uh, and how we can, uh, and seeking God really for what we're going to be and where we're going to be in the future uh, in the centre of Orpington. Yeah. So good. Can you just tell us a bit about how you started leading at Orpington and how long you've been at Hope now for? Been at Hope for 30 years exactly, 30 years and one month. Uh, Andrea, my wife, uh, we and your mum, uh, we, we were one of the original uh, small team that planted uh, Orpington, what was known as Town Church then, from a church in Sidcup. Uh, and I think we're the uh, bar one or two, we're the sort of last remaining sort of remnant of that. But it's been so exciting to see it grow and you know we were in our early 20s and uh, the church was growing really fast and uh, then we were involved in youth leading the youth uh, been involved with children's work uh, and increasingly um, small group leadership became an elder we were a good good few years many years ago and now uh, i've gradually stepped back a little bit from the business that i run uh, to be able to get more involved in the church as well thank you so much hi julian hi molly um if you could just tell us a little bit about what you do here at hope church what you get up to behind the scenes and what your role involves sure um i'm based at the hope or Orpington congregation i support gary as he leads the congregation here working full-time i can do a lot of the stuff which uh, uh gary needs to get done obviously he's working part-time also running cooling's garden center so really helping him behind the scenes Additionally, I've got a real heart to see uh, people come to faith and then grow in their faith. So I do quite a bit of work on that. I've uh, been involved in Churches Together in Orpington and they recently asked me to join the leadership team there, uh, primarily again to encourage evangelism across the churches. Could you just tell us a bit about how you started and how long you've been been at Hope Church? Sure. So I, um, I always had a heart to work for the church full time. Just didn't come into being. Uh, ended up working for Booper for 31 years. Took early retirement in June 2019 and started working for Hope in September 2019. And I'm loving it. Is there anything that you uh, didn't expect um, when you started working for Hope? Sure. I certainly didn't expect to be uh, responsible for running a food hub. There was nowhere <laughs> on the uh, agenda when I started, but amazing what God does. And the second thing, uh, I never expected to be involved in any form of technology whatsoever. So if my team <laughs> call me now, they're killing themselves laughing. So I was running the room uh, for the opening congregation. Yeah. <laughs> Just shows you you can do anything if you put your mind to it. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Julian. Hi, Ken. Hello, Molly. How are you? I'm good, thank you. All right. Um, what? Doing good. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you do here at Hope Church, what your role is and what you get up to behind the scenes? Okay, thank you very much. I'm the Congregational uh, Leader of uh, Hope Church Downham. Yeah, it's been a pleasure working with uh, being in such a position and responsibility. And uh, for me, as a Congregational Leader, it's not about the post, but the responsibility that goes with it. So basically, I see myself as a shepherd of the sheep. My role is to make sure that the sheep and that every member of the church is well cared for. So behind the scene, you know, because when I first became a pastor some years ago, I thought it's all about preaching good sermon. But I eventually realized that my work as a pastor begins when I come down from the pulpit. I visit people, pray along with people, basically i mean to everybody's life every member of the church life so basically there is so much but yeah, yeah. we just walk around the clock and keep everybody yeah. you know, strengthened in the yeah. world yeah 
Could you just tell us a bit about how you started working for Hope and how long you have been working for Hope? I started in Nigeria. My background was a Pentecostal pastor in Nigeria, and uh, but I eventually took off the congregational leadership of Hope Church on the 1st of October, uh, 2020. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. If you can think of anything, um, what's the strangest thing that's happened or that you've experienced whilst being at Hope? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I think I, I will yeah. say this. From where I'm coming from as a, a Pentecostal pastor, you know, we have some ideas uh, and, and some, you know, the way, you know, we thought that you have to present yourself as a pastor. I remember the first time I, I came to preach in Hope Church or painting, I came with my normal, you know, Pentecostal background with my suit and tie and everything. And when I came in, I, you know, Tony said, why are you dressed like this? <laughs> you know? <laughs> because our our, you know, where, where we're coming from, you have to present yourself. In fact, it, you can be disciplined, you know, placed on discipline if you're not properly dressed. But when I came into Hope Church, I found out that, you know, people are encouraged to just just be yourself and uh, and let the grace of God in you speak forth for you. I don't know whether to use the word strange, but if I may say strangely positive to see that kind of yeah. experience. I think it's yeah. good. We encourage you yeah. to just come as you are and let the grace yeah. of God be made manifest in your life. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Thank you so much for your time. It's been great just getting to know um, a bit more about you and what you do behind the scenes. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. Thank you so much. Hi, Mike. Hi, Molly. Could you just tell us a little bit about what you do here at Hope Church? Yeah, I mean, basically, I just feel called to uh, generally equip the saints and um, for works of ministry. So I think that's what uh, I'm primarily involved in. And that's through, obviously, through prayer, through uh, preaching and teaching, through counselling. But um, I mean, also, I do feel very sort of strongly about the mission and the missionary aspect of the congregation, because uh, I believe we are here primarily to reach those people who are not yet in the church and are not yet saved so there is that uh, that missional impetus certainly within me which has sent me out walking to be quite honest i'm trying to get out walking and just listening to the holy spirit and sharing the gospel with people which i have been able to do on one or two occasions since i decided to do that is there anything that you didn't expect when becoming um you started leading Chiswhurst. Yeah, the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> oh dear, well, yeah, that's been interesting. I mean, I, uh, obviously, so I've been doing, um, I was working full time up until the 2nd of September last year when I've obviously gone part time. So obviously going, going part time uh, in these rather unusual times and circumstances, mm. uh, certainly, <laughs> certainly didn't expect that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's been that's been quite um, quite un unusual, and uh, but I mean, you know, uh, God has been good, uh, hasn't He? And I think yeah. the fact that we've been able to communicate online has been has been wonderful, mm -hmm. to be quite honest. The fact that you can actually maintain, if if not develop, relationships online, and being mm -hmm. able to, uh, you know, preach and have prayer meetings and worship, uh, which has been authentic and meaningful. Been great yeah yeah, yeah. yeah 100 yeah. percent, definitely have you got a favorite thing about working at hope i mean i just I, I i love being part of the eldership team that's great i've got a, i mean my congregation is just fantastic really i just we just so enjoy each other's company and enjoy meeting together um worshiping having fun uh so yeah i mean i think i think the people molly i think that's that's my yeah. my considered response yeah. yeah and enjoy the presence yeah. of god i mean you know enjoying the presence of god which makes all the difference molly doesn't it yeah 100 percent. well thank you so much mike for your time pleasure hi pete hi molly if you could just tell us a little bit about your role within hope church and what that involves yeah, so um, yeah, my name is Pete. I lead our Bromley Common Congregation. I'm pastor there. And I guess it's it's my job uh, there to pray for people, whether they're a Christian or not. It's my job to talk to people about Jesus, again, whether they're Christians or not. Um, I guess it's that 
that's the simple answer. Um, but also it's a very complex and complicated answer because when you talk to people about Jesus, it, I guess it leads into all every all and every aspect of life. So I guess, yeah, my role is to love everybody, serve anybody, especially in, in uh, our congregation at Hope Bromley Common, wanting to see people deepen their love for God and walk with him and, and grow in him. Um, yeah, that's in a nutshell. Yeah, amazing. Is there anything that you didn't expect when becoming um, the leader of Hope Bromley Common? Yeah, I guess um, just the, the variety of uh, every day is really different. Um, you know, you can be a, an administrator most of one day, you can be a building consultant the next, you're a carer, a community builder, leading discussions, uh, events organising, yeah. evangelist. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just completely varied. Uh, funeral yeah. planning, yeah, yeah. Um, preaching, public speaking, um, yeah. wedding ceremony planner, you know, yeah. uh, uh, quality controller. You know, there's just such a variety yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of the role includes. Yeah, 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 that's great. If you could pick a favourite thing, what would it be about um, working at home? Um, yeah, one of the things I, I love about Hope Church is um, that we have such a, a breadth and depth of team and diversity in our team, which is continually growing and expanding. I love, um, what I love at Hope is that we are always looking to extend the kingdom of God through planting churches, raising up disciples and, um, and, and mobilizing people to serve God in their gifts and, and having a team, um, uh, a broad, a big team around us, um, is uh really helpful to see that actually happen yeah it's really good thank you so much pete thanks for having me good morning guys my name is kwamana i serve at our bromley common congregation i'm so happy that you've joined us this morning i hope you've got your coffee i hope you've got your tea hope you've got your toast because we're going to delve into the word first i'm going to pray and then we're going to hit it Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to bring the gospel to you today, to the, to the people in the congregation today, Lord. And I just pray that you will use my words to touch people in the, in the audience. In your name I pray. Amen. So what I'm going to talk about today is Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Um, and we're going to start by dealing with the, th the themes of the day. So basically the main theme is an unrelenting faith regardless of our circumstances. I'll, give, I'll start with a little anecdote. Um, those of you know who Michael Jordan is, if you don't, he is a, an amazing basketball player and he's known as one of the greatest of all time. But one thing that people don't really know is that he was actually cut from his high school basketball team because he, wasn't, he was deemed not good enough. But he knew he was good enough and he had a laser-like focus on his goal and he didn't give up. Now, we could say that's an unrelenting faith regardless of his circumstances, but we're going to back it up with a bit more of the Bible. So how can we have faith that overcomes every circumstance? Now I'm going to start by reading the passage. So if you join me at verse 46. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Now, it's key to note that any healing story in the Bible can easily be misinterpreted. The connection that we have between faith and health is one that can easily trip us up. We as humans tend to operate within a set number of rules. If I do A, I'll get B. But this is not one of those situations. It's not one of having more faith means you have better health or vice versa. The reward is, is not simply what we can see, and that pun is intended. This passage is one that spoke to me on a deeper level. I've been in many situations when all I had was my faith. I remember when my wife and I were early married, we lived in Gloucestershire and I studied in Birmingham. And I remember there were times when we didn't know when the next tank of fuel was going to come from. We didn't know when 
the next job opportunity was going to come from. We had to really have a faith that trusted in God, trusted on what he stood for rather than what we knew. So how can we be persistent in our calling out? And I'm glad you asked that question. I've got three points for you. So the first point, we need an unfiltered faith. Now, Bartimaeus had a faith that was crystal clear. He knew who Jesus was and he understood the magnitude of his presence. Who exactly is Jesus? Now, that's a big question. But let's actually revisit who he was. He was the son of God and the king of kings. He's done great things. And we have the luxury of having the Bible to back it up. But at the day in that day, it was all by it was all by word of mouth. Now, Bartimaeus, as a blind man, would have only learned this from passers-by. Bits of info passed from person to person. Now, it's also, it's easy in today's world with our distractions to water down and complicate the simple fact of how great Jesus was. He died for our sins. The one and only who was without, without sin, without fault, took all of our sin, all of our shame, and died on the cross. Now, we don't need to complicate that. The gospel, the truth... It's like a good plate of jollof rice. It doesn't need any extras to be delicious. Bartimaeus cries, son of David, which is a callback to the Jesus lineage. So in the, in, the, in the day, this was seen as, I know who you are. I know your greatness and I respect you and your bloodline. He showed that the name of Jesus had traveled before him and he had grasped it and he knew who he was. He wasn't blinded by the distractions of the street, but he, but, and he wasn't blinded by his own personal gospel. He was clear in his faith, crystal clear. So as I said, Bartimaeus did live on the side of a main road. So all the communication he had with others was in passing. He was still able to decipher with those nuggets of wisdom how great Jesus was. That faith was able to cut through all the nonsense. You can imagine him asking a passerby, who, who, who's, who's that guy you talk about? Who's that Jesus we talk about? And learning more and more each day. This is another part of the Gospels where the societal norms of today and of the day are rejected. I mean, we see this in the next passage when Jesus entered Jerusalem. Now, the scholars and the Pharisees of the day, they were who were expected to grasp the idea of Jesus. But the Gospel uses people who were seen at the bottom of Jewish society and sometimes today's society had so they had the best understanding. His understanding was pure and unfiltered. It was not, it was not, it was, it was not dealt with rank. It was not marred by anything else. His faith was a childlike faith. Now I've got the beautiful privilege of being a father to a six month old girl and She's learning the world every single day. And one of the great things I've, I've realized about her is not only her tenacity, but the unwavering face she has that I'll catch her every time she tries to jump off the sofa. She will see something the other end of the room and I can watch her do it. She'll see it and she'll leap for it. Now I have to make sure I'm on my toes. She has a faith that says, if I go for it, dad, you'll get it. And also in our own upbringing, how many of us believe the words of adults verbatim because why would they lie to us we should have that kind of faith with God why would he lie why would he set us up why would he mess us around it empowers us to do things in Christ's power not our own key that in Christ's power not our own we need to also remember that faith itself is not something we have made up as man it's a gift from God as Christians, we receive the gift of faith and it's part of the armour to protect us. I mean, think about that. God has given us a gift, given us something so precious to protect us. And in having faith that doesn't really trust, it, having faith that doesn't trust and doubt, it weakens that gift. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. I'll read that quickly. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We understand that the faith we need needs to be clear and focused. But what's the next step, I hear you say? We need a relentless and a persistent faith. Now, Bartimaeus' faith was strong despite his hindrances. 
And in Mark's gospel, we see examples of this faith all throughout. In chapter two, Jesus heals a paralyzed man after he's lowered into the room. In chapter five, he raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. And in chapter seven, he heals a deaf and a mute man. All of these people were seen as too far gone, too far gone. And if there's one thing you get for today, you are not too far gone. Jesus does want to meet with you. He does want to know you. These situations were not mildly inconvenient. They were big problems. I mean, imagine in chapter two, a man who cannot move is lowered through the, imagine being in the room with Jesus and the roof caves in and somebody's lowered down. I know about you, I would be petrified, but that shows an un, a relentless faith at all costs. But to add to this, the crowd were trying to silence Bartimaeus. Now that's something which you pass over, but it's quite key. We really don't know the full motives behind it. We can only speculate. But we, it's easy to assume that it's something that doesn't happen today. It does happen, unfortunately. How many times do we see people walk past a homeless person as if they don't exist? And how many times when faced with injustice in the workplace or in public, do we stay silent because it's simply uncomfortable for us to speak up? That is the same premise as shushing Bartimaeus. The behaviour is something that we can also see in our churches, unfortunately. If your friendship group is very similar to you, that could be a reason why we are limiting people's grace, people's faith. They were threatening to limit the range of Jesus' power and how, and how he was able to show his grace and his love. They were putting God in a box to suit them. They were saying, no, we have come to see Jesus. You on the side of the road should keep quiet. But this is where we see the full strength of, of Bartimaeus. What does he do? He doubles down. He shouts louder. He had a faith that could not be stopped. When he was told to take it down a notch, he gave him a five notch increase. I wish I could do that every single day. His faith was not dependent on the situation and it wasn't dependent on the actions of others. It wasn't a, if this person is nice to me, I'll believe in you. It wasn't a, if I get this job, I'll believe in you. It was, I will believe in you regardless of what happens. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse one to three, it reads, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It literally says our faith should not be what we can, based on what we can see. His faith was like standing in a valley and thinking all you can see around you is that's it. But I'm telling you for free, God is up there. He sees further. He sees the promised land. He says, if you trust me, you will get through that valley. You will get up that mountain and you will get to the promised land. What you see is not it. He had the utmost confidence in Jesus. Now, we, know we now know we need a faith that is unfiltered and we now need, know we need a faith that is unshakable, that's rooted in the truth. But there's one final point. He needed, you need an expectant faith. Now, Bartimaeus was very clear in his approach. When Jesus asked him what he wanted, he offered something he knew Jesus could deliver. Now, we need to break this down carefully because it can be misunderstood. He asked for something he knew Jesus could deliver. He didn't ask for what he thought he could deliver. He didn't limit his expectation. He asked for something simple yet so great. He just asked for his sight to be restored. He had the opportunity to ask for anything, for riches, for status, for his enemies to be smited. But no, he just asked for simple sight. This request declares that he knew that Jesus could provide the wholeness that we're missing. And it's so true in our world today. Unfortunately, sometimes the gospel can be replaced with self-gratification and self-worship. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and mammon. And mammon loosely translated means earthly things. You cannot have an expectant faith when you're distracted by your own desires. Bartimaeus confidence and clarity in what he expected from the father was just, it was just spot on. Jesus didn't come to bestow power and honor. 
If that's your prayer, then I, my friend, I've got some bad news for you. And I've got some good news. I'll start with the bad. He won't do it for you. But here's the good news. He won't do it for you, but he'll give you way more than you ever thought. Much like he restored the sight of Bartimaeus, he can also restore our spiritual sight. He can open our eyes to the new possibilities, spiritually and socially, that can only come when God reigns. It can only happen when God reigns. So when I said earlier on, he will not give you riches of this earth. He can give you riches of this earth, but only when he reigns, only when he is the first fruits. I mean, he's got the power to heal the sick and raise the dead. He definitely has the power to give you a promotion. But this is not a gospel which is rooted in prosperity. This is to say, God, God is the one, the alpha, the omega. When we say, won't he do it? It's not just a refrain that sounds cool, not just a refrain we say we snap our fingers. It's a statement, won't he do it? Now, to land this message and to let you get on with the rest of your afternoon, I'm gonna leave you with a few points. In bringing you the message today, I cannot guarantee or promise you a cure to any situation you're going through. What I can promise is what Jesus promises when he says he is the way and the light. As a community, as a church, as individuals, we can embody this faith, this unshakable faith, this faith rooted in the truth and proclaim the wholeness in which Jesus restores Bartimaeus' sight. He didn't just restore the sight, he restored him completely. His restoration was not just physical, it was spiritual. The difficulties he faced were not there to, are not there to distract us from the pure and confident image of faith that he provides. Neither should it dilute the simple truth. Jesus is the way and the light. Now to paraphrase the disciples called him Bartimaeus, when you're calling up to God and asking, where are you? Take courage, get up, he is calling you. Thank you for watching and have a blessed day.
all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you, no matter how much the cost. I freely give it all to you, all to you. I just want to move your heart, caught within your gaze, right here. Where I want to stay, oh, just to dwell in your house. I waste my hours and my days on you, all on you. And is it a fragrance? And I'll pour my oil out. Is it a fragrance? And I'll pour my oil out. Oh, my oil, is it a fragrance? Oh, 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 my oil. song I sing then here's every melody just tell me what moves you just tell me what moves you is it a fragrance then I pour my oil out is it a life laid down then here I give my vows is it a song I is every melody just tell me what moves you 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 Okay, we thank God. It's been a great time in God's presence this morning. I'm, I believe you enjoyed the service. So see you next week and uh, uh, our life and local services continue. So if you want to get more details about that, just speak with your, your, your congregational leader and they will give you more information. God bless you and have a lovely week. Bye-bye. Bye.